Lecture 28, Analyzing Social Interaction. So far, our study of psychology has taught us two facts about human nature. The first is that humans are intelligent creatures. We do not operate merely by reflex, taxis, instinct, and conditioned response. Rather, our behavior reflects active cognitive processes of perceiving, learning, remembering, thinking, and communication through language. But humans are also social creatures, and that's the second important fact. Our experience, thought, and action takes place in an explicit context of cooperation, competition, and social exchange, family and group memberships, and institutional, social, and cultural structures. For this reason, psychologists need to understand the relations between psychological processes that occur within the individual and social processes that take place in the world outside. While much of cognitive psychology is concerned with how the individual acquires, represents, and uses knowledge, social psychology is concerned with the role that cognitive processes, and emotional and motivational processes as well, play in social interactions, interactions between individuals and between individuals and groups. The classic framework for the analysis of social behavior was provided by Kurt Lewin, a refugee from Hitler's Europe who settled in the United States in the 1930s and became a leading figure in American social psychology. Employing the language of mathematics, Lewin asserted that behavior is a function of personal determinants and environmental determinants acting together. By behavior, he meant the individual's overt behavior, behaviors that are publicly observable. By personal determinants, Lewin meant the individual's mental states and dispositions, such as knowledge, beliefs, feelings, motives, and attitudes. And by environmental determinants, Lewin meant to include all the factors that impinge on the individual from the outside, including aspects of the physical environment and aspects of the socio-cultural environment. This formula has sometimes been called Lewin's grand truism, because if you think about it for a second, there's not much left by the time you've taken into account personal and environmental determinants of behavior. Nonetheless, this formula provided the framework for personality and social psychology as it began to develop in the 1930s. And, as I think you will see, it turns out to be not such a truism. It turns out to be rather a profound idea. Traditionally, personality and social psychology have historically emphasized different aspects of Lewin's formula. Traditional personality psychology assumes that behavior is primarily determined by features of the person, such as his or her beliefs, attitudes, values, emotions, motives, and personality traits, and that situational factors are largely irrelevant. So, from the point of view of personality psychology, as it has traditionally been practiced, behavior is largely a function of the person. For example, some particular behavior, like smiling, might occur as a function of some particular personality trait, like friendliness. So, a traditional personality psychologist would measure that trait, perhaps by means of a questionnaire, classify people as high or low, and then observe them to see if they're smiling. And what you might find is that people who are high on the trait of friendliness are more likely to smile than those who are low on that same trait. This example illustrates the canonical method of traditional personality psychology, which is to construct a psychological test to measure some personality trait, and then to use this information to predict how an individual will behave in some specific situation. The test might take the form of a self-report questionnaire of the usual sort, or a rating scale completed by the subjects themselves, or by others who know them well, or even a sample of the subject's actual behavior from which his or her standing on the trait dimension would be inferred. In this research, which is often based on the correlation coefficient and related techniques, the trait measure, like friendliness, serves as the predictor variable, and the behavioral measure, like smiling, 
serves as the criterion variable. Here's an actual example of how this research goes. As part of an ongoing study at the University of California, Berkeley, Ware and John measured the level of conscientiousness in a sample of students in the MBA program at the business school. For this purpose, they used some scales from a questionnaire known as the NEO Personality Inventory, which we'll talk about a little bit later. They then tracked these students' arrival times at various appointments. One finding was that highly conscientious individuals, those who scored high on the conscientiousness scale, tended to arrive a little early for their appointments, while those who scored low on the conscientiousness scale tended to arrive significantly later. In this case, a feature of the person, the trait of conscientiousness, predicted a criterion of punctuality. Research like this exemplifies what's known as the doctrine of traits, a theoretical point of view that is derived to a great extent from the work of Gordon Allport, one of the early figures in scientific personality research. The doctrine simply says that social behavior varies as a function of internal dispositions, like traits, that render a person's behavior coherent, stable, consistent, and predictable. I'll define each of those terms later. These dispositions are commonly studied in the form of traits and attitudes, but other personal dispositions are also relevant to behavior, such as the individual's moods, motives, values, and beliefs. By contrast, traditional social psychology emphasizes the other side of Lewin's grand truism. It assumes that behavior is primarily determined by features of the environment, and especially features of the sociocultural environment, such as interpersonal, organizational, and cultural factors. And it also assumes that individual differences in personality, people's standings on trait dimensions, for example, are largely irrelevant. Behavior is a function of the environment. So, for example, to return to our example of smiling behavior, we might arrange an encounter between a subject and another person, maybe an acquaintance, maybe a stranger, and see if smiling occurs more often in one situation than the other. It might turn out that the average person is more likely to smile in the presence of an acquaintance than he or she is in the presence of a stranger. And that example illustrates the canonical method of traditional social psychology, which is to manipulate some aspect of the social environment, such as whether there are other people present or not, who they are, or what they are doing, and observe the effects of this manipulation on behavior in some specific situation. In this research, which often uses the t-test and variance as its basic statistics, the manipulated variable, for example, whether the subject is in the presence of an acquaintance or a stranger, serves as the independent variable, and the behavioral variable, like smiling, serves as the dependent variable. For a real-life example, let's return to the study by Ware and John. In fact, these investigators measured punctuality in two different situations. Half the subjects were given an appointment in the morning, and the other half given an appointment in the afternoon. When they examined punctuality as a function of the situation, rather than as a function of the person, they found that the students tended to arrive late for morning appointments and a little bit early for appointments scheduled for the afternoon. From this point of view, punctuality depends on a feature of the situation, the time of day at which the appointment is scheduled. Research like this, traditional social psychological research, can be said to be based on what might be called the doctrine of situationism. That is, that behavior is controlled by features of the environment, particularly the social situation. Situationism in social psychology is very closely related to the kind of behaviorism espoused by John B. Watson and B. F. Skinner. Skinner famously wrote in one of his books that a person does not act upon the world. The world acts upon him. The individual's behavior is a function of the environment outside the individual. To sum up, 
Traditional personality psychology construes behavior as a function of personal determinants like traits and the environment as fairly irrelevant. Traditional social psychology construes behavior as pr principally a function of the environment, with personal determinants like traits largely irrelevant. However, these traditional formulations are largely misleading. Nobody believes that one factor is exclusively responsible for behavior and the other is wholly irrelevant. Everybody accepts that personal factors and situational factors probably combine somehow to cause behavior to occur. When Lewin put that comma in between P and E in his grand truism, he left open the possibility that P and E were both important and that they combined somehow to generate behavior. The question is, how? One possibility is that the personal and environmental determinants of behavior are independent of each other. That is, each set of factors exerts its own separate influence on behavior without affecting the other one in any way. In such a situation, behavior might be partly predicted by personality traits and partly affected by situational manipulations. But the two kinds of effects are independent of each other. They don't have anything to do with each other. So suppose we took a group of people classified them as high or low on friendliness as measured by some personality questionnaire, and then we exposed half of each group to a situation in which there's an acquaintance, somebody they know, and the other half of each group to a situation in which there's a stranger, somebody they don't know. Friendly people would probably be more likely to smile in both situations compared to the unfriendly people, and the acquaintance would probably be more likely to elicit smiling than the stranger regardless of the sub subject's level of friendliness. Note that the difference between friendly and unfriendly subjects is constant across the two situations. And the difference between acquaintance and stranger targets is also constant across levels of friendliness. Behavior is predicted to some extent by the personality trait of friendliness, and behavior is affected to some extent by the situational manipulation, the presence of a stranger or an acquaintance but these effects are independent of each other. In the language of the analysis of variance, the effect of friendliness on smiling is a main effect. The effect of the situation on smiling is another main effect, but there is no interaction between these two main effects. They're independent of each other. Returning to our actual study of punctuality, when Ware and John examine their data as a function of both the person that is, level of conscientiousness, and the situation, time of day, they found that, indeed, the effects of the two variables were completely independent of each other. You can see this in the almost perfect parallel lines. Whether their appointment was for the morning or the afternoon, highly conscientious people arrived earlier than less conscientious people. And regardless of where they scored on the conscientiousness scale, People whose appointments were scheduled for the afternoon arrived earlier than those whose appointments were scheduled for the morning. You can predict arrival time by adding together the effect of personality and the effect of the situation. Again, if personal factors and environmental factors are independent of each other, then the effect of the personality variable is the same regardless of the situation that the person is in and the effect of the situational variable is the same regardless of the person in it. For most of the 20th century, personality and social psychology proceeded largely independently of each other down these two quite different tracks. Personality psychology studying the relationship between traits and behavior, and social psychology studying the influence of the situation on behavior. But in the 1960s and 1970s, there arose a vigorous trait-situation controversy or debate over which factors were more powerful predictors of behavior, internal traits or external situations. I'll have more to say about this debate later in this series of lectures. The debate between traits and situations faded as psychologists began to consider a much more interesting possibility, that the personal and environmental determinants of behavior interacted with each other in a variety of ways. For example, 
The doctrine of interactionism proposed by Kenneth Bowers, an American psychologist who spent his career in Canada at the University of Waterloo, holds that people influence the situations that in turn influence their behavior. As he put it, neither traits nor situations are the primary determinants of behavior because situations are as much a function of the person as the person's behavior is a function of the situation. Environmental factors are not independent of personal factors. Rather, people can influence their environments just as their environments influence their behavior. Here's a schematic diagram depicting the interaction of personal and environmental factors in the determination of behavior. First, we have our two familiar vectors, from the individual person and his or her traits and attitudes and the like to his or her behavior. And the second vector, from the environment, various features of the physical and social situation to the behavior that occurs in that environment. But now we've got a new vector, tracing from the person to the environment and reflecting this doctrine of interactionism, that people influence the situations in which their behavior takes place. Interactionism agrees that people's behaviors are influenced by the situations in which they find themselves. But because it views people as part of their own environment, it holds that personal factors of the sort envisioned in the doctrine of traits can still play an important role in behavior by changing the environment in which the behavior takes place. One way to think about this interactionist perspective is to argue that different kinds of people show different patterns of response across different situations. In mathematical terms, personal and situational factors are multiplicative. But interactions are probably better seen graphically. So, for example, it might be the case that friendly people are more likely to smile than unfriendly people. But this difference might be bigger when they encounter a stranger than when they encounter a friend. After all, anybody can smile at a friend. That's no big deal. It takes a really friendly person to smile at a stranger. Or, put another way, friendly people might discriminate less between the two situations than unfriendly people would. Either way, this situation is known as a person-by-situation interaction. Note, in this example, that behavior is predicted to some extent by the personality trait, just as the doctrine of traits hypothesizes. And behavior is also affected, to some extent, by the situational manipulation, just as the doctrine of situationism says. But these effects are not independent of each other, so you get more predictive power if you take into account the two different kinds of factors. We can summarize the doctrine of interactionism as follows. If person variables and environmental variables interact, the effect of the personality variable is going to depend on the kind of situation the person is in, and the effect of the situational manipulation is going to depend on the kind of person exposed to it. Depicted graphically, the person-by-environment or person-by-situation interaction takes a number of forms. In the crossover interaction, there is no main effect of either person or situation. You can see that by computing the means involved, but the difference between the two groups or between the two situations reverses from one situation or group to the other. In a kind of interaction known as the fan effect, there is no difference between the two groups in one situation, but a big difference between them in the other. There are other forms of interactions as well. I've just used these to give you a sense of the basic idea that the effect of a personality variable is going to depend on the situation the person is in, and the effect of the situation is going to depend on the kind of person who is in it. Before we go on, I want to point out one more feature of the doctrine of interactionism as we've discussed it so far, which is that the person-by-situation interaction may be characterized as unidirectional. Causality is always going in one direction. Personal factors might influence behavior, and environmental factors might influence behavior, and people somehow affect the situations that they're in. Causality is always going in one direction, 
from the person to behavior, from the environment to behavior, or from the person to the environment and then to behavior. But that doesn't have to be the end of it. If the person can affect the environment, why shouldn't the environment influence the person in turn? And it certainly does. To take a very simple example, on the whole, people become happier when they're in the company of happy people, and they become sadder when they're in the company of sad people. The environment, the mood state of the people surrounding the individual, can influence the individual's own mood state. And if personal dispositions, like traits and attitudes, can affect a person's behavior, why shouldn't behavior feedback to shape those very traits and attitudes? And certainly this happens too. When we're learning a new skill, like tennis or piano playing, we may initially have doubts that we can return that volley or make that arpeggio. But then we try, and if we succeed, we say, hey, I can do that. I might be good at this after all. The behavior feeds back to change the person who engaged in the behavior. And finally, if the environment can affect the behavior that occurs within it, why can't that behavior feed back to change the environment? Clearly this happens too. This was Skinner's insight and why he called the form of learning that he studied operant conditioning. In Skinner's view, the behaving organism operates on the environment and that operation changes the environment in some way. Thorndike's cats pressed a paddle and changed the environment of the puzzle box from one in which the door was closed to one in which the door was open. Skinner's pigeons, working in an operant chamber, pecked the lighted key and changed the environment from one in which there was no food to one in which there was food. People at a funeral might be very sad about the loss of a friend or a loved one, but then someone will crack a joke or tell a funny story about the dearly departed, and all of a sudden the mood seems to lighten. That behavior has changed the environment in which it took place. Albert Bandura, a psychologist at Stanford University, has called this state of affairs reciprocal determinism. In reciprocal determinism, causality is bi-directional. Where the doctrine of interactionism asserts that people are a part of their own environment, the doctrine of reciprocal determinism goes even further to assert that people, their environments, and the behavior they display within those environments together form a complex, dynamic, interlocking system characterized by bi-directional, or what's sometimes called non-linear, causal relations. Just as people are part of their environment, so the environment is a part of the person. And because the person's behavior takes place in some environment, that behavior is also part of the environment, and therefore part of the person. In a very real sense, reciprocal determinism is a state of affairs envisioned by complexity theory, also sometimes known as chaos or a catastrophe theory. The basic idea, again, is that the person, the environment, and behavior constitute a complex system of dynamic elements, interlocking elements, characterized by bi-directional causal relations. So here we see a schematic depiction of the full scope of interactionism and reciprocal determinism. The causal relations between the person and his or her behavior, the environment and the behavior that takes place within it, and the person in the environment in which his or her behavior takes place, all these elements are involved in bidirectional causality. In other words, each element in Lewin's formula, not just the person and the environment, but behavior as well, each of these elements serves as both cause and effect of each of the others. Because these reciprocal causal relations involve three elements, Bandura has also labeled this expanded notion of reciprocal determinism as triadic reciprocality. Reciprocal determinism in general, and triadic reciprocality in particular, entails a very interesting situation in which everything is both the cause and the effect of everything else. That's what we mean when we talk about complexity. However, Reciprocal determinism does not necessarily mean symmetry, 
in causal strength. The bidirectional causal influences are not necessarily co-equal in strength. The causal effect of personal factors on behavior, for example, might well be stronger or weaker than the reciprocal causal effect of behavior on the person. In general, the relative strength of each of the six causal links, two in each direction between each pair of the three elements, will vary across particular persons, environments, and behavior. Nor does reciprocality imply simultaneity of influence. When personal factors exert their effects on behavior, the behavior may not be influencing the person's states and dispositions at precisely the same time. More likely, as implied by the notion of feedback, these bidirectional influences unfold over time. And again, the time course of this unfolding may also vary across persons and environments and behaviors. Somebody enters a room in a good mood, cracks a joke, and lightens the mood of everybody else in the room. The person's mood state has affected his behavior. That behavior has changed the environment. And now, for that matter, the lightened mood in the room may encourage the person to crack more jokes. That's what we mean by triadic reciprocality unfolding over time. Still, when everything in a complex system is affecting everything else, things are going to get awfully complicated awfully quickly. For this reason, it's rarely possible to study triadic reciprocality in all of its dynamic glory in any single experiment. Fortunately, however, the lack of simultaneity, the fact that these reciprocal causal relations unfold over time, works to our advantage because it permits what we call an analytic decomposition of reciprocal determinism, in which we break triadic reciprocality down into its bidirectional segments. This yields what I call the three dialectics in social behavior. Dialectics coming from the Greek word meaning dialogue, because that's what it is. First is the dialectic between the person and his or her behavior. How the person's states and traits lead him or her to behave in a particular way, and how that behavior then feeds back to change the person, him or herself. Second, the dialectic between the environment and behavior. How certain features of the environment will elicit behavior, and then the behavior that takes place in an environment changes the character of that environment itself. And then third, and finally, there's the dialectic between the person and the environment. We'll see how features of the environment can shape the person's moods, emotions, motives, and traits. And then we'll look at the various ways in which people shape the very environments in which their behavior takes place. Of course, this aspect of the dialectic between the person and the environment returns us to the doctrine of interactionism, which is pretty much where we began. Let's begin with the dialectic between the person and behavior. But first, we have to talk about exactly what we mean when we refer to those characteristics of personality that cause a person to behave the way he or she does. We begin our exploration of the dialectic between the person and behavior with an analysis of just what the personal determinants of behavior are. These personal determinants of behavior consist of a wide variety of internal states and dispositions. Most of the literature has focused on two categories of internal states and dispositions, traits and attitudes. Traits are behavioral dispositions such as friendliness or aggressiveness. Friendliness, a disposition to engage in friendly behaviors. Aggressiveness, a disposition to engage in aggressive behaviors. Attitudes are evaluative dispositions. Tendencies to like or dislike certain categories of things. So we might say that somebody has a liberal attitude or a conservative attitude, that someone is pro-feminist or anti-war. Traits are just dispositions to behave in particular ways. But attitudes always carry this emotional, evaluative dimension. Attitudes are always for or against something. Then there are emotions or feeling states such as happiness or sadness. 
we have already talked about the structure of emotions in an earlier lecture. And motives are states of desire, such as hunger and thirst, or achievement motivation, or the need for affiliation. Some of these motives are biological in nature, others are social in nature, but all motives drive, direct, and select behavior. Values are personal priorities, such as the valuing of happiness over money, or art over science, or religion over economics. In principle, at least, we behave in accordance with our values. Our personal values cause us to make certain kinds of choices. And then, finally, beliefs are convictions in the truth of certain statements, such as that God exists or that life is sacred. In personality psychology, perhaps the most interesting beliefs are those for which there's no hard evidence or where the evidence is controversial. But whether the belief is warranted by the evidence or not, still our general expectation is that people will behave in accordance with their beliefs. So in each case, the idea is that these kinds of internal factors, these internal states and dispositions, cause a person to behave in particular ways. Friendly people tend to smile, liberals tend to vote for Democrats, happy people laugh, hungry people eat, people who value art over science give money to museums, and people who believe in God go to church or temple or mosque. In these lectures, we're going to focus mostly on people's traits and attitudes, because that's where most of the research is. But how do we know what traits and attitudes a person has? The answer is that we have a set of psychometric techniques for measuring these personality characteristics, much the same way as we measure intelligence. By far, the most popular way we have of measuring somebody's traits or attitudes is by means of self-reports. That is, having people report on their own traits and attitudes. For example, people might complete a questionnaire that asks how they tend to behave in general in various sorts of situations. Do you find that you like most of the people you meet? Or do you like to have a lot of people around you? People answer yes or no, or rate themselves on some kind of numerical scale. Or we can simply present subjects with the name of the trait or the attitude in question, and ask them to rate themselves on that trait in terms of some numerical scale, say, one meaning very low, seven meaning very high. You can ask people simply to rate how friendly or aggressive they are, how liberal or conservative. Or we can go to somebody else for these kinds of ratings. We can go to your roommate or your parents or your boyfriend or girlfriend and have them rate you on these personality dimensions. Less often used is a technique known as objective behavioral observation, where we actually follow people around and record the frequencies with which they engage in various kinds of friendly or aggressive behaviors. In these days of electronic gadgetry, we can give people a Blackberry or an iPhone and from time to time call them up and ask them what it is that they're doing. This is, of course, a lot more expensive than collecting self-reports or using rating scales, which is why it's not done more often. But it is a technique that's been used to good effect in some personality research. The process of assessing individual differences in personality traits and attitudes so that we can try to predict people's behavior raises the thorny question of exactly how many dimensions are needed for that job. The problem, very simply, is that there are a lot of ways in which people differ from each other. Gordon Allport, to whom we owe the doctrine of traits to begin with, actually went through an unabridged dictionary and identified 17,953 different words in English that can be used to describe some psychological differences between people. Words ranging from absent-minded through laconic, quarrelsome, xenophobic, and zealous. Actually, somebody else went through Allport's list and discovered he had miscounted. There were actually 17,954 such words in the dictionary he used. And obviously more have been added in the years since then. That's obviously a lot of trait names, and no experimenter is going to present his subjects with a list of 18,000 different trait words and ask the subject to rate himself on each and every one.
The first thing we need, if we're going to do research on personality and behavior, is to come up with some relatively small list of personality dimensions that allows us to capture the gist or the essence of the individual's personality. This basic question for personality research concerns the structure of personality. We want to know what the basic dimensions are of individual differences in personality that lead people to behave the way they do. This question has been addressed by means of a statistical technique known as factor analysis, which is based on the correlation coefficient. Factor analysis is simply a technique for summarizing the patterns of correlations between variables. You get people's ratings on a number of different traits, and then you calculate all the intercorrelations among all these different traits. Factor analysis will summarize that whole pattern of data by revealing the basic underlying dimensions, which traits tend to correlate with each other and which traits don't. You'll remember that Thurstone and other investigators used factor analysis to explore the structure of human intelligence. Here, the same technique is being used to explore the structure of human personality. And when investigators have done this, they've discovered that they need only five traits to summarize the basic dimensions of personality. There appear to be only five traits that are fundamental to personality description. These are extroversion, the tendency to be talkative as opposed to silent, sociable as opposed to reclusive, adventurous as opposed to being cautious, and open as opposed to secretive. Neuroticism, or its reverse, emotional stability. Neuroticism is a tendency to be anxious versus calm, excitable versus composed, hypochondriacal versus not, nervous and tense versus poised. Agreeableness, the tendency to be good-natured as opposed to irritable, cooperative as opposed to negativistic, mild and gentle versus headstrong, not jealous. Conscientiousness, the tendency to be responsible versus undependable, scrupulous versus unscrupulous, dependable versus quitting, fussy and tidy versus careless. And finally, openness to experience, also sometimes known as intellectus or culturedness, a tendency to be intellectual in interests versus unreflective and narrow, artistically sensitive as opposed to artistically insensitive, imaginative as opposed to being simple and direct, polished and refined as opposed to crude and boorish. Extroversion, neuroticism, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness to experience. These appear to be the basic dimensions of human personality, the small number of traits that allow us to capture the gist of individual differences in personality. These five dimensions of personality have been found so often by so many different investigators that they're now known as the Big Five personality traits. And the idea is that these Big Five personality traits represent a universally applicable structure for personality description, permitting comprehensive descriptions and comparisons of personality applicable to people of any age and any culture at any time. I call the Big Five the Five Blind Date Questions, because they represent the most important things you'd like to know in advance about someone you don't already know, but whom you're going to spend some time with. Is she outgoing? Is she crazy? Is she friendly? Is she trustworthy? And is she interesting? Really, what else would you need to know that's not somehow represented in these five questions? A similar approach has been taken to the structure of attitudes, if you think about it for a second, there are an almost infinite number of things in the world that you could have attitudes about, pro or con. You can't measure them all, any more than we can measure all 18,000 personality traits. So we need to have some kind of basic structure that captures the gist of a person's attitudes. Here, there's still some controversy. But in general, attitude researchers have focused on one big dimension of attitudes, ranging from liberalism on the one hand to conservatism on the other hand. More recently, attitude researchers have suggested that there might be a second dimension 
of traditional morality underlying people's attitudes. But the basic structure of attitudes really is organized around a single dimension of liberalism versus conservatism. I suppose you might think of the dimension of liberalism and conservatism as the big one structure of attitudes, but it might be that such a monolithic, unidimensional structure doesn't really get at the heart of these individual differences. Some attitude researchers actually deny that there are any structured attitudes at all, that our attitudes are just a hodgepodge of views. Other researchers find it convenient to classify people as liberal or conservative with respect to particular domains, political, economic, religious, social, and aesthetic. It's entirely possible that somebody could be politically liberal, but still have conservative religious or social views. That you can be an economic liberal and still not like modern art or modern music. So while the big five structure of personality traits is very widely accepted, and we're going to refer to it often in the next couple of lectures, the structure of attitudes is still something that's somewhat in dispute.